Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, all of you who are joining on Zoom in this session, all of you who are watching live on Facebook. On behalf of Dong Yu Gasoline Nunnery, I would like to welcome all of you to this monthly Q&A session with Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo. Um, we will be doing this um, hopefully regularly from now on every month as much as possible. And uh, I would like to thank all of you who have submitted your questions online and encourage uh, those who you, of you who haven't to submit questions for the next session, which will happen in June. Uh, however, now we can get started with this particular uh, first session that we're having. And of course, thank you so much to Jitsuma Tenzin Pamo, who's here with us already. Um, so Jitsuma, should we get started with the session? We'll jump straight to the first question that comes from Jana, uh, asking about um, setting up a morning routine to happily start the day and achieve that sense of fulfillment at the end of the day. What do you think, Jitsumala? How do we accomplish that? Well, I, I think first of all, we have to make a commitment, right, to ourselves to get up early enough to set time for some formal practice. Because unless we get into a routine, it's not really going to work. You know, it gets less and less and less and then tapers off. So we make a commitment. We're going to get up at such and such a time, which will give us the space to uh, have a formal practice. Then we can make aspirations for that day, for cultivating our kindness and awareness. We start, if we are Buddhist, we start by taking refuge in the Three Jewels. And then we set up our bodhicitta aspiration that we are not doing this practice merely for our own benefit, but so that we can train our mind in order to be of genuine benefit for all other beings. And so that sets our, our motivation. Then we do whatever practice we are used to doing, you know, whatever it is. And we make the determination that we're going to use the day for um, benefiting others, not just ourselves, and for transforming our negative emotions into positive ones, like our anger and our greed and our jealousy and all that. To really work on that, that's the work we're going to do, not just during our formal sitting, but throughout the day. We're going to transform our day into our Dharma practice, right? So then maybe uh, in the early morning read a little inspirational literature also, just to set the mind in the, in the right phase. And also at night, it's good before going to sleep to read just a little bit of something which inspires our mind so that we can sleep with, again, pure thoughts, good, good heart. And that also is very helpful for waking up with a good motivation, right? So then, you know, really, I think when we begin, as beginners, we shouldn't make the sessions too long. Because if the sessions are too long, then we will feel, oh God, I've got to sit and do this, and it becomes like a burden. So keep it short, but during that time, how whatever time, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, make the determination that we are giving this time for our inner being. The rest of the day may be for outer activities, but this is our time and we're not going to play around. Come on, mind, get yourself together. You know, concentrate for once. And so that's why it's, it's helpful in the beginning to keep it short, but, but clear, vivid, rather than long and wandering all over the place. So the most important thing is our determination and commitment that this is our special time and we're going to keep to it. OK. Um, so the next question comes from Soya Gilroy, and it says, how do I stop wasting so much time worrying, letting go of worries, consume my daily life, which in turn ruins the present moment? 
how do I stop letting other actions, others actions bother me or get rid of my expectations? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, just relax, right? Why tense up? Just relax. The past is gone. The future hasn't come. And, you know, what is happening in this moment? That's the question. In this moment, what is happening, right? So, you know, we all need to try to be more conscious, more aware, and not get sticking ev in everything, you know, to allow things to just pass. It would be useful if you are doing formal meditation to bring up, to look at the mind and see the repeated patterns of worry and anxiety because this is just a learned habit that the mind has got into. And if we begin to be able to see that, we can begin to be able to relax that and change the way we're thinking. Right? It's because we're, we're trapped in our, our thought patterns. So we need to step back and observe those thought patterns without being identifying with them. Just seeing this is, you know, like some people have um, anger patterns and some people have greed patterns. And so nowadays especially, people have worry patterns. So I would also say cut down e intensively on media involvement you know don't watch the news all the time because the news is always going to be bad and don't you know absorb all the, the newspapers which is full of you know again of very very negative it's all negative don't do that you know really if we are able to deal with the moment the present moment we can deal with the future uh, our skill is in right here and now being poised here. How are we relating in this moment, at this time? Because if we learn how to be skillful in the present, then the future will take care of itself. And we don't have to worry at all, right? But again, it's all practice. I mean, so many of these questions assume we just have some technique and snap, everything changes. But it's not like that. You know, we have to practice and practice and practice like any skill, right? Until finally it becomes innate within us. And as far as other people are concerned, you know, we don't need to always re react to how other people act. That's their problem, not ours. Inwardly, we should be relaxed and just allow them to be how they are and, and allow allow things to slide off us, not grasp at it, you know. I say sometimes to keep a Teflon mind, right, non-stick. Just allowing things to, to, you know, not holding all the cooking inside and heating up more and more and more like a pressure cooker, right? We shouldn't become pressure cooker minded. We should allow things to just move and not judge so much. You know, people are people. You know, so just let them be how they are. I mean, we cannot change others, but we can change ourselves, right? And the only change we can hope for is to change our own response to other people's actions, right? That we can do. So we can, you know, in one way you can, we can view it like a rerun of some TV show. You know, oh no, not that one again, right? We are always endlessly recycling the same old situations and the same old responses. And, you know, so let's change the channel, right? And cultivate less judgmental mind, more compassion, more kindness, and a good sense of humor. Because I think it's very important to s really smile at ourselves and smile at others. Okay. All right, so we can move on to the next question. Which comes from our friends in Slovakia, which says, if I were to die right now, let's say with a heart attack or a sudden accident, 
which would be the best practice to rely upon? <laughs> I love that question. I mean, quite frankly, if one wants to die immediately, it's a bit too late to think about practice. <laughs> um, but on, having said that, um, one time uh, we had a truckload of small nuns uh, in the back of our open truck uh, and uh, the truck overturned and all the nuns were thrown onto the road. And one nun later said that as she was tossed out of the truck onto the road, she thought, this is it, right, finished. And she thought of Guru Rinpoche, Guru Padmasambhava, and also her delight in being a nun. Those two thoughts came into her mind. Then she lost consciousness when she woke up because she was still there. But the point was she had, her thought was Guru Rinpoche. Uh, she surrendered to Guru Rinpoche because she had devotion to Guru Rinpoche in her life, right? This is the point. In the Chinese Mahayana tradition, they say Omitofo, which means Amitabha Buddha for everything. When they meet Omitofo, when they say goodbye, Omitofo, you saying thank you, Omitofo something happens, Amitabha! They are always saying, invoking Amitabha Buddha, so that if they die suddenly, their first thought will be, Amitabha! Then Amitabha will come. Right? When, when Gandhi was shot and killed, as he died, he said, Ram Ram, calling on the god Ram, because he was a devotee of Ram. So that was his last thought, right? So the important thing, therefore, is during our life to focus on our object of devotion uh, so that at the moment of, of dying, spontaneously, that will come to our mind. We can't suddenly think of something that we haven't thought about much in our lifetime. We can't hope for that. So we have to train ourselves now so that at the time of death, we will be prepared and we will be ready. So that, that's the point, right? Get ready now. That's what our life is for. Yeah. Practice for death. That's beautiful. And that, um, in that context, the, the word uh, for meditation, Bhavana, requires a very profound meaning because we just familiarize ourselves with things, right? Even this exactly. mantra, uh, uh, an image, whatever it is that we familiarize ourselves, not necessarily in formal meditation, but in any context, right? Exactly so. that, exactly that. And, and then that will spontaneously arise. And, and that could be, you know, liberation on death. Beautiful. We can hope for that. <laughs> we can all hope. Uh, <laughs> the fourth question comes from uh, an anonymous person. And it says, if we see someone mistreating someone else due to their own afflictions, is there a way to interfere without creating any, any negative karma for anyone involved? So, you know, we need to deal with such situations like that with both wisdom as well as compassion. You know, this is, this is really a challenge, right? We need insight into just how to deal with someone's negative emotions, especially anger, without creating more aggression and harm. That, that's the challenge, right? So, of course, compassion itself can be very strong and fearless, but it needs a clarity to understand how best to act in these situations, right? So, uh, for example, in traditional iconography, um, uh, Avodhikiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, has a thousand arms to reach out to help, but each hand has an eye, right? So he understands in each situation how to act most opportunely, so as not to make it even worse. And that's why we need both wisdom and compassion in these situations. It sounds uh, beautiful, Jitsumala. I think very hard to apply it, especially if we haven't cultivated skillful means. But it's, it's very hard, and that's why we should be careful not to 
make the situation even worse. Would you say that sometimes it's better just not to intervene and then watch our own minds and see how the things, you know, uh, go on instead of jumping into a situation that we may not have control? Yeah, I mean, it, it needs delicacy as well as strength to, to really understand how the situation can be um, benefited by our stepping into the role. Otherwise, we could end up making it worse. What to do? I mean, life isn't that simple. So the next question is very short, but I think not so easy. Uh, and it comes from uh, Isadora Remai, and it says, it's suffering the only way to purify karma. Well, first of all, karma can be good as well as bad, right? I mean, so we have good karma and bad karma, not just, you know, karma. And when difficult situations do arise, such as loss or sickness, we usually ascribe that to unskillful actions from the past, right? Uh, uh, so we think, oh, bad karma. But if we take this suffering onto the path, then we can learn a lot from it. I mean, the whole of the, uh, so much of the Lojong teachings, the mind training teachings, are how to take um, the results of negative karma and transform them into a, a very powerful practice. So it's not all bad. This transforms suffering into a spiritual benefit, actually. But in any case, in the Vajrayana, there are uh, also purification tree practices such as Vajrasattva or the uh, recitation to homage to the 35 Buddhas or Nyungne, the fasting in Nyungne and so on. And these are specifically to help purify past negative karma, right? So, but you know, honestly and truthfully, this is samsara, right? Why people, and so of course, everything is not gonna be perfect. I mean, how can it be, right? Samsara by its very nature is not comfortable, right? And nor is it always in accordance with our ego's wishes, right? Things are going to happen the way they're gonna happen, however we want to plan it in a different way. So we have to work with what comes skillfully and not categorize it, oh, this is bad karma, this is good karma. This is just what's happening. How can I respond skillfully and take all of this happiness and sadness onto the path? Thank you, Jitsumala. Um, is, there any, is there anything in particular, is there any point that separates uh, just experiencing suffering without any any notion of purification and actual purification does the intention to purify have a role to play in that well of course if you're doing purificatory practices like vajrasattva then definitely the intention is to um, clear away a lot of the backlog as much as possible um, but apart from that you know when things are difficult it's mostly often difficult because our mind is telling us it's difficult. And, you know, if we change the, the, the message and said, this is something which is trying to teach me something, what can I learn from this situation? What is the cause of the suffering? And often it's our attachment and our grasping and our unrealistic ideas of how things should be instead of just opening up and accepting how things actually are. So it's up to us to learn, you know? Either we can, you know, make a double suffering, right? That not only the outer situation, but also our unskillful response to that situation, or we can take that difficult outer situation and transform it into a very powerful practice. It's up to us. In the end, everything depends on our own inner attitude. So we have to change our attitude. Well, that's very encouraging, Tetsuma. Thank you. 
Um, it's not so easy to change your attitude. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, I was going to say it's not so easy. I mean, you could say that. That's, that's easy to talk. It's actually, we are very habituated to our own comfort, inner comfort. And so it's difficult to change, but we can do it. That's the, the good thing. It's, everything is possible. It says, Thank in you. general, Dharma practice and worldly aims are incompatible. What would you advise to find the balance not to be a Dharma fanatic and at the same time to integrate a desire for satisfaction in a relationship? Well, of course, it's really very, very important. It's essential, really, to um, make our daily, daily life into our Dharma practice as much as we possibly can so that the worldly life and Dharma become one, right? So we can use our relationships with our family, our loved ones and colleagues to cultivate, you know, these essential qualities like loving kindness and compassion, generosity, patience, and all these other good qualities which we need to cultivate, which are very much a part of the path. We need other people, you know, so our relationships are by no means a, um, an obstacle for us to practice Dharma. They can be the opportunity for practicing all these beautiful qualities which we need. So throughout the day, we must really try to be more mindful and aware and more kind, you know. We can cultivate ethics, generosity, patience, all the other paramita. And every breath we take with awareness is a Dharma practice. So there's no, you know, there's no dissonance between the two. As long as we are conscious, we can be practicing. Um, moving on to the seventh question, which comes from Aditi. If one is new to Buddhism, how should one find a master or teacher? What kind of things to keep in mind? Is there anything you can say on finding the right Sangha, wise companionship in your journey? Well, I think if one is new to Buddhism, then one should start by, by reading some basic Dharma books and watching online presentations by, by you know, good teachers, because there's a lot online nowadays which is very, very authentic, you know, so Good teachers nowadays, unfortunately for us, are usually surrounded by many, many students. So it's very difficult to um, imagine that you're going to get a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship with, at least with some famous teacher. But there are many teachers out there who people don't know about. And so, you know, in time, you know, there are so many approaches. So look around, right? And see what, what feels right for you. There, there isn't one single path, one single teacher we, who is the right one for everybody. Every different person has a different need and a different uh, kind of empathy with certain approaches, right? So don't jump into the first thing on offer, you know, unless it feels right for you. That's the point, you know. The, the one doesn't have to have just one teacher actually you know you can benefit from many different approaches until one finds not only a teacher but also the sangha around him that one feels inspired and confident with i mean the, the idea nowadays is that you only have to have one teacher and you mustn't ever look at anybody else sort of like getting married you mustn't look at anyone else um, but in fact, in, in actual fact, it's not always like that. And the teachers themselves had many teachers. I mean, His Holiness the Dalai Lama often says how he has 25 teachers. And he puts them all on his refuge tree. And he's very grateful to them all. He learns something from all of them. And he sees them, uh, you know, with, with great respect for what they c he could learn from them. So we shouldn't be afraid to uh, look around uh, and, and learn from everybody whatever is, is necessary. And not to be anxious 
a lot of the practices actually we can do ourselves. I mean basic shamatha practices, there's wonderful teachings on that, how to arouse bodhicitta and all these, these um, bases of, of the practice which are going to stand us in very good stead, the foundations, we can do ourselves. We don't need necessarily to have um, you know, one-on-one -on -one instruction. Also join, you know, if you hear there's some meditation course over the weekend or, or teachings over the weekend from someone, you know, yes, one can go and get guidance, personal guidance. But the important thing is to keep an open mind and, and appreciate that all the approaches are good approaches. And we just need to find eventually the one which especially, you know, strikes a chord within us. But don't be anxious, you know. And also you can pray to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to you know, help you on the path so that as we need it, the, the right instruction comes at the right time. Well, as I say again, you know, if you find a teacher, he probably has students. And uh, one of the things to, to look at, in fact, when you are trying to look for, you know, maybe to commit yourself to some teacher, is do you like the people around him? Because they often reflect the attitude of the teacher, and especially the senior students. Would you want to be like them? because that is also uh, an important consideration, you know, this is where he's leading them, and is that where you want to go, right? And in the meantime, you know, find people who are interested, maybe not even necessarily Buddhist, but nonetheless have a spiritual, you know, interest, have good values. The Buddha prays very much good companionship, and how important it is to have good friends. But they don't have to necessarily be card-carrying Buddhists. They could just be good people, right? Who are, and those kind of people we should hang out with. And then also you can take part in Zooms nowadays and meet up with many people. Make, they make little groups on Zoom, right? They're in different countries, but they have a common interest and then they, they make a commitment to meet every week or month and um, come together like that. So nowadays we can also make use of technology. Please allow me to follow up a little bit on, on this one um, because it actually, this question resonated a lot, a lot with me. Um, when I was starting with Buddhism, as you know, in Bolivia, we didn't have much to, uh, to go with. And uh, so I started looking for sources from all over and ended up seeing people, uh, listening to people uh, from both uh, different traditions, right? Zen, Theravada tradition, Tibetan tradition. So connected to this question of finding a teacher and a Sangha, but also, you know, looking what resonates with oneself. Do you think it's really necessary or important to follow just one thing and, or we can take the Buddha's teachings in their uh, more open uh, form in their more essential form because after all, Theravada, Sen, Chan, Tibetan Buddhism, we're all Buddhists, right? So what do you think about that? Well, I think it's very important to have a, a certain practice, set practice, that uh, you are following, and a path that you are following. But within that, you can also implement it by other approaches. I mean, for example, when uh, I, I would go to America, uh, I would often be invited to give talks in Zen centers, Korean Zen, Cha Japanese Zen, Chinese Zen. And I would say, well, what do you want me to talk about? Because I can't talk about meditation in a Zen center. And they said, no, no, that part, the wisdom side we have, what we need is the compassion devotion side that we don't have such strong teachings on. And the Tibetans have very good teachings on that. So please could you talk about that side which we're lacking. I mean this happened in a number of centers. And so I would talk about devotion, the importance of devotion and compassion. And people afterwards would come up and say that's just what we needed to hear. 
you know, because, you know, it tends to, if we're not careful, be up in the head, but where is the heart? And so in that way, they're still very committed to their Zen practice, but they also have the ad addition of um, some basic practices for developing devotion and compassion, which enhance their, uh, their central practice. So that's the point. I think we need a central practice, a central path, but then we can take from others to enhance that and deepen our, our, our appreciation of the practice. So this one, number eight, comes from Yael Ophir. Um, and it says, lately I have realized how the small self can seize even a Tonglen practice and use it for self-enhancement. It says, I'm breathing in all your sorrows and pain. Have no fear. Let me. I can handle it all. And there it is. Within such comforting and supporting, supporting statement, a strengthened ego. How to handle it? Um, perhaps, Jetsumala, for this one, if you could just briefly, briefly uh, mention what Tonglen is for those uh, who don't know. Uh, Tonglen means literally sending and, and receiving. And it's a practice in which we, we uh, visualize someone who is in suffering and with the in-breath we take in their suffering in the form of dark light and then with the out-breath we transform that into uh, white light or, or some brilliant light uh, to um, relieve them of their suffering. So we, we take in the suffering and its causes and we breathe out healing and, and well-being. So it's this in and out riding on the breath. Uh, it's a very important practice for uh, overcoming the ego, right? Which, so this is the thing. We have to start from where we are, right? Which is with the ego. So who wants to be egoless? The ego, right? The ego is saying, yes, now I'm going to be egoless. So, so first we have to be aware, as he is, of the ego's need to take control. Just relax and, and smile at it, right? That, that ego desire in itself is just empty. We shouldn't take it too seriously. The ego itself is empty. It's not a real entity, right? That's our mistake. So, actually, when doing the practice, if the ego really believed it would receive all the pain and sorrow of another, it would be terrified. So at the moment you're just playing with the idea, right? Yeah, and it doesn't seem real, right? So therefore the self feels enhanced, right? There I am taking on the sorrows of the world. But imagine deeply taking on the sickness of someone, someone you really know and care about, taking that from the depths of your being, that their sickness comes on you, like a mother with an only child. If a mother has her child who is sick, like recently we went, well, a while back we were in Bombay and we visited this cancer hospital for children. And there were these little children with cancer and their mother. And the mother would give anything to take that sickness onto herself. She would rejoice if she could take that sickness and the child would be cured. That's not ego. That's genuine compassion. That's what we're aiming for. Right? So just keep going. Just keep going until, yeah, you, you know, the heart really bursts open. The Buddha himself said, just like a, as a mother loves her child or only child, right? He used that as an example for loving kindness and compassion because that's the most, in a way, uh, pure love in that the mother would do anything for uh, relieving her child from suffering. She would be happy to take on that suffering. On to the ninth question, which comes again from our friends in Slovakia. Uh, it says, uh, I would like to ask about inspiration. 
as an artist, I often come to a state where I will get a lot of answers to questions. It is a state where I feel that my brain is not working and I'm just listening to my inner voice, which is bypassing the brain. And I am connected to some stream of information, which feels completely natural. My head is at that moment completely empty and calm and information just flowing in undisturbed. Can this be some form of meditative, meditative state? Can, how can one approach and develop this? So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really very interesting question. Um, I, I will start by, by uh, mentioning a, a book I read, which was written by this uh, um, wealthy American gentleman in the 19th century. In those days, wealthy Americans, cultured Americans would go to Europe and buy up all the art. And so he, I think he was probably a theosophist, I don't remember. But anyway, he went to Europe and he met with all the top artists and musicians of those days, um, the, the really famous ones like Rodin and, and Bruckner and these type of people, Brahms. And he asked them, what is your state? when you are composing or painting and you know that uh, the work which is then viewed by others as being a work of genius and they it was really interesting they all in their own way said it's when we drop the ego when we are working with our brain and our conceptual mind then the, the work we produce is very routine, just the, the same old stuff. But if we can let that go, relax within, then from within us, as he's saying, not to do with the head, but to do with the deep inner source, comes this whole other, um, what can you say, uh, creation, which is beyond the ego. And, and they don't have to direct it, it just comes up from within. And then later people look at that and say, oh, that's brilliant. But it was not them that was doing it. It was something beyond the self, beyond the ego. And this is genuine creation. Otherwise, it's just, you know, you've learned how to do something and it's nice. And so you just keep repeating the same old thing. So when we're able to drop the ego then we can access this level of consciousness which is free natural and truly creative right so this is where genuine artistic genius lies i mean they all agreed on that and it probably doesn't help to want it too much because that is just the ego you know, grasping again, which is the problem in the first place, right? So inwardly, it, I think it helps just to relax and allow the joy of creation to arise in its, at its own will. You know, you can't, you can't program it. So, sorry, I, I think the only way is just to allow the mind to be completely open and relaxed and invite perhaps but not grasping because if we are always hoping that this is going to happen like that then that in itself creates the block because it's the ego that blocks the creativity within ourselves so just just relax you know it originally it takes an effort to be effortless but in the end, you know, the thing is just to allow this to happen and give space. And good luck. It's beautiful that he has access to that. That's very good. But indeed, it, it's important not to allow it just to become another ego projection. And not worry when it does, you know, just relax. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. It's not something you can just, you know, program. 
one very interesting thing that came to mind just now hearing you talk to Tsumala. Um, the people who recognize this work of genius, uh, you know, they, they, they see something else in that work of art when it's kind of, uh, when the artist becomes just a medium. Do you think it's also because we all are, in, are connected with that pure nature ourselves, even if we're in our conceptual thinking mind, we can see that that thing has some extra value because it's coming from something very pure. Would you say that's the case? Oh, yes. No, no, no. I mean, you know, when you hear great music, you know it's great music. You might not be a musician, but it hits you straight at the heart. I, I remember listening to the, the, uh, the second movement of uh, Mozart's Violin Concerto Number no. 4, and I had no idea about Mozart, no idea of anything, but it was like falling in love. And I, I thought, if there's music in heaven, this is it. You know, it was so beautiful, beyond words. I mean, and it hit at a level beyond conceptual thinking. And also, if you see great art, you know, when I lived in Italy, I didn't know much about any artist, you know, Da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo, that was about it. But I would see a, 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 a painting or a, a work of sculpture and wow! And it was always from a well-known artist that I'd never heard of, but then I heard actually he's very famous, like Fra Angelico or Piero della Francesca. But, you know, with all the mediocre art, suddenly that would just hit you, straight at you. And it was nothing to do with being an art connoisseur. It was of coming face to face with someone else's great creative genius. And it hits you at your own uh, deeper level. And that is great art, great music, great anything. That it goes, it bypasses the conceptual thinking mind. So let's move on to the next question from uh, Renata Mikolasik. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If not, I'm very sorry. Uh, how to cultivate devotion? Is it possible to develop at all, or is devotion and faith something given, something karmically conditioned, and you either have it or you don't? Well, in general, of course, devotion can be cultivated by appreciating the exceptional qualities of the object of our faith, right? I mean, uh, obviously, some, pe some races like Asians and maybe Latin people have a capacity for devotion because they seem to have a closer connection with their heart emotions. Um, but we can all practice, you know, really all can practice opening the heart because this is how blessings are received. You know, it's very important um, to... to uh, if we, w we want to get the, the blessings, then we have to open up our, our heart. And our heart is opened through our faith and devotion. So we, we need to recognize how important this is. The way that Buddhism has been transplanted in the West often bypasses faith and devotion. And it becomes very cerebral almost you know, all up here. And we need very much to bring our, our practice down into a much deeper level of consciousness, which is opened through our faith and devotion. And definitely, you know, as I say, you know, if we think of, of you know, the object of our devotion and really appreciate that, you know, what, why, why is this special? What qualities do they enact, which I also need to develop? And then we, we feel deep appreciation and love and devotion. It just comes up from the heart. And that's when we're at, again, this, this deeper level that we're just talking about with the creative force. You know, in the West, everything's up in the brain, but it's, the brain is just, you know, just a very s small part of our, our true being. And, and the more important levels of our consciousness 
are, are much deeper within us. We feel it as being deeper and that it's here rather than up here. And, and that's what we need to, to develop and open up because then everything opens up. Otherwise, it's the brain and what the brain can contribute, which is fantastic, is nonetheless very, very small and narrow compared with the, the heart awareness, which is vast and all-encompassing. And connects us. I mean, this is very important. It connects us with, with all, all living beings instead of separating us and making us distinct, which is our big problem and why people get so depressed because they feel very separated, isolated. This is a way of connecting us with the whole of nature and all living beings. So yeah, devotion and faith, is, you know, work at it. So moving on, um, we can go to question 11 from Sharon Berry. In Buddhism, hope is often viewed as being about desire and attachment. Is there room for wise hope that we can engage in? Well, you know, of course, um, along with the hope, which is that everything will go right, comes fear that everything will go wrong. So, um, so that is at least in accordance with the ego's ideas, you know, that we hope everything is going to go the way I, the ego, wants it to go. And, you know, we worry and we have anxiety because we think it may not go the way the ego wants it to go, right? So we get trapped then in endless hopes and fears, right? The, but aspiration, aspiration is something else. Aspiration is very, very necessary, right, on the path. And that might be called wise hope, right? That, um, and also, you know, the wish that things should go well for others um, as well as oneself, because we say may all beings be well and happy and free from suffering. That's a hope, right? So there, there's, there's wise hopes, you know, uh, you know, that we will be able to continue on the path, that we will meet with the right instruction when, you know, we need it, and, and so forth. I mean, the, these, these aspirations on the path are very important. So yes, there is wise hope too. I mean, it's just the, this hope and fear complex is that, you know, we're always hoping to make samsara more comfortable. And um, that is a deluded hope. Um, because samsara, by its very nature, is not very comfortable. So, you know, then we should, instead of hope and fear, which are the two sides of the same coin, we should have uh, wise acceptance right and and the ability to take whatever comes and make use of it on the path if we can do that then there's no hope and fear in the ordinary sense of the ego's planning the ego is always planning but you know the ego is deluded by its very nature what does it know and so you know in that way hope and fear are, are too too you know they, they make the mind restless and th not at, at peace, not at peace. So that's those ordinary hopes and fears, therefore, are regarded as obstacles on the path. But wise hope and wise aspiration is very important. This question came from two different people. Um, um, it's dealing with... Uh, Suicide, basically how to deal with the suicide of a loved one. Well, you know, obviously this is a very, very painful subject and it's an increasingly common problem. Um, you know, one hears about suicides, especially among young people, increasingly much. It's very, very tragic sign of our time that so many young people feel so completely despairing that they can't even be bothered to live. Um, and of course, it's not just the young people who have taken their life and all their potential. 
but those left behind feel so much guilt and, and helpless. I mean, this is the, the repercussions of that. That it's like throwing a stone in a lake and then the ripples just spread out further and further and further. So, I mean, what to say? I think first we should accept that this suicide was not our fault, right? Drop the guilt. What use is the guilt? It was brought about by many causes and conditions outside of our control, right? I mean, there's no point in, in lacerating ourselves on top of our loss, just endlessly, you know, scratching the, the wound to make it bleed more because that makes us feel better because we feel so guilty. That's not the way to go. We have to heal, right? So also we, we can contemplate that we are all the owners of our own karma and each of us has our own path to follow through countless lifetimes because it's not just this lifetime but many lifetimes to come, what will happen next. So we have to accept this terrible thing has happened, right? It happened. We didn't want it. Who wanted it? But we have to accept it happened. You know, things do happen that we don't want, but that's it. So then, then it's of course when if someone dies, and especially if someone commits suicide, so they're in a disturbed state of mind, it's, it's very good to have prayers done for the deceased and also to make merit on their behalf and dedicate that merit to them, right? I mean, sometimes, especially in India, if this happens, I, I recommend that, that the parents or whoever is grieving could do like a pilgrimage because that gets them moving out, meeting others going and inspiring places and making merit on behalf of the deceased to um, be dedicated to them, right? But then if we feel guilty, we need to look at that feeling of guilt. We need to sit and look at that feeling that we feel, all the feelings we have with compassion, right, towards ourselves and also practice loving kindness towards ourselves as well as towards others. It's very important that we heal ourselves, really. I mean, sangsara is difficult. This is what nowadays nobody wants to admit. Sangsara is difficult uh, and we have to accept this. You know, it doesn't always work the way we want it to work. It doesn't. And people don't always do the things we would want them to do. They don't. And we have to accept. Acceptance is the most important thing. To recognize this happened and then to accept it and to cultivate compassion for all concerned. And then to go on. Not to get stuck in, in that one event which was so awful and the worst thing we could imagine. Let it go. It doesn't help the one that's deceased and it doesn't help ourselves either to just get stuck in that, that one event. We have to clear it and clean it with our compassion and our love and our understanding and let it go and carry on. What else can we do? So we can move on <coughs> to the next question, uh, which comes from Monica Sardinia, um, which says, even though my children are now adults, I still try to meddle in their lives. How can I give them all the help they need and care for them without invading their lives? Quite a honest question from Monica. Well, try imagining a beautiful butterfly in the palm of your hand, right? A very fragile but beautiful butterfly. So you, we would hold it very gently, very carefully. 
very tenderly. But if we clench our, our hand, if we clench it saying, oh, you're such a beautiful butterfly, I'm going to protect you, then we have killed the butterfly. And I think that we, you know, honestly and truthfully, we do not even own ourselves. How can we think we own our children? Right? So in this life, of death, this is their life. This is what we have to remember. We have had our life, and we're still carrying on with our life, but this is their life. It's not my life. It's their life. And they should be allowed to um, lead it how they feel is right for themselves. Right? So therefore, let them, let them dance their own dance. Might not be your dance, but it's their dance. And give them the freedom and the space to dance the way they need to do. And rejoice with them in whatever they come up with. I mean, just let them go. I mean, as the Buddha said, honestly and truthfully, the Buddha said, grasping and attachment is the cause of suffering. And it's true. We think that the more we grasp, that we will feel secure. But actually, it's the cause of insecurity because nothing can, that we cannot do that, you know, it doesn't work. And the way to feel secure is to open up and allow things just to manifest and uh, be as they are without trying to endlessly interfere and make things go the way the ego would like them to go. So laugh at the ego. When you see yourself doing that, you know, just laugh at yourself in a kind way, right? Not a nasty way, but in a kind way. Just see, oh, here is my habitual grasping and meddling mind coming up again but I'm not going to give in to you. I'm going to allow my children to be who they are and express themselves how they are and I'm going to rejoice in them as they are without trying to interfere. Then everybody's happy. They're happy, you're happy and you can join their dance but you're not trying to make them change their patterns. They, we all dance together. Okay, so the next question comes from Lydia Villarejo and says, uh, what should be our attitude toward our physical image as a spiritual practitioner and how to detach ourselves from its importance? I feel that in today's society, physical appearance is given way too much importance and that obsession with ourselves limits, limits us while undermining our self-esteem. Undoubtedly. And it causes, of course, so much suffering because, you know, all these people, especially women, are judged by their appearance and judge themselves by their appearance, as we know. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's very sad. It's very sad. Um, the point is that the body is the, the guest house for our consciousness right and this is where the consciousness abides in this lifetime so of course we obviously we're going to keep the room where we're living clean and neat but we we have to remember we it's only a guest house and we are going to have to leave it soon and find another hotel room so in other words we keep ourselves healthy and we keep ourselves clean but we remember we are not the body. We have a body, but it's much more important to keep our mind clean and neat and healthy, right? Nicely decorated with all the qualities of the heart, loving kindness and, and generosity and appreciation that's where we live, you know, so we should cultivate the mind, don't worry so much about the body. We keep our body clean, neat, healthy, appreciate the body, how wonderful it is, really amazing. But we are going to have to leave that aside and what will carry on is our consciousness, our mind. So what we need is to 
really pay attention to the mind, make the mind clean, healthy, and beautiful. Decorated with all the beautiful qualities of the heart. That's what we're taking with us. The body, however gorgeous it once was, we're leaving behind. So look at our mind, throw out the junk, open the windows, clean it up, get space in there and make it beautiful. So it's a delight to dwell within our mind, within our heart, because that's where we live. Not the body, but the heart, the mind. So that's where we have to pay attention. And of course, you know, modern life is so superficial and it, it also equates happiness with pleasure. But that's a huge big mistake. Happiness is an inner feeling of joy, which arises when the mind is quiet, calm, peaceful, filled with love and compassion. Then joy, genuine joy, arises in the heart. And that is what we're looking for. Not physical beauty, which anyway is going to decay and, um, and uh, you know, change. I mean, we, if we don't die beforehand, we all get old. So in the meantime, the mind should become more and more beautiful. Even as our body ages, the mind becomes more and more in one with the true Dharma, which is a, a clear, transparent awareness and loving kindness shining within us, because that's it. If you look at people's eyes and their eyes, are, however beautiful they may be, if their eyes are dead, you know this is a very, very sad person. But you can look at the most outwardly decrepit looking being and if their eyes are shining with joy and kindness then that person is so beautiful and that's the point yeah real beauty is within and that's where we've got to work at you know making a beautiful beautiful heart which gives joy to ourselves and to all others also Yes, yeah, so that's what we have to think about. Keep ourselves healthy, respect the body, take care of the body, but don't get obsessed with the body. Really, really appreciate how fantastic it is that we have such a wonderful, wonderful mind. And let's cultivate that. So we can move on to another question from our friends in Slovakia, which says, how to reduce thoughts linked with attachment and desire and have contentment, how to relax general agitation and a restless mind. I mean, you know, what do you think? Yeah, there's this technique and you just practice it for half an hour and zap, right? We have no more attachment, no more agitation. Everything's calm and beautiful and we're totally non-attached. Practice. We have to practice and practice and practice. I mean, it's like learning any skill. If we want to master an instrument, musical instrument or painting or sport or any skill, we have to practice and practice and practice. What to speak of mastering the mind, right? I mean, it's, it's a long process. I mean, honestly and truthfully, sorry about that, but it takes a lot of work. Right? Because we are habituated through lifetimes to being attached and full of desires and agitation and restlessness. This is the problem. It's not something which just came to mark yesterday. It's something which we carried with us after lifetime, after lifetime, after lifetime, all through this lifetime. And so it's deeply rooted inside our psyche. The Buddha said that anger, although karmically more negative, is relatively easy to remove because we don't like anger. We feel uncomfortable with anger. People don't like us if we're angry. We would like not to be angry. 
we would like to be more peaceful and patient. That sounds really good. So we work at it. Or the qualities that are needed to oppose being angry. But attachment and desire we like. And we often think that this is the root to happiness. Right? If we could only, you know, fulfill our desires and have a very strong attachment to someone that we care for, this will make us happy. And so therefore we are very much less motivated to work on attachment and desire. I mean, sometimes I, I tell the story of when I was in Lahul, in living in the cave. And outside the cave was this kind of level area, a kind of patio. And um, it was made of uh, hardened earth. So therefore, when the snow melted or when the rain came, it was like very, very muddy. So therefore, I decided to lay down these flat stones, these kind of flagstones. So I carted all these flagstones down. But in order to lay the flagstones in this uh, area, this kind of patio area, were these little clusters of pink flowers with little yellow centers. They would cluster little flowers, small, but little clusters of these little flowers. And so I thought, well, I can't la lay the flagstones on top of them because then they will wobble. They will be, I have to pull out these flowers. So I, I tried grasping them and pulling, and they wouldn't come. So then I got a pickaxe and started digging down to get to their roots. And I ended up, literally, the whole patio was dug up because underneath were all these roots, some of them this big, all intertwined underneath, deep, 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 and covering the whole patio. And they appeared as just these little clusters of innocent little flowers. And I thought, this is just like attachment and desire. Outwardly looks very innocent. What's the problem? Very sweet. But the, the roots are deep, deep, deep in our psyche and very thick and tenacious and not seen for what they are. So it's very, very difficult. This cause of dukkha, of suffering, is our attachment and desire, the Buddha said. And we don't believe it. We think it's the cause for our happiness. Right? So this is not an easy question. Yes, just do this and then you'll be fine, you know. How to reduce thoughts linked with attachment and desire? Joke. Right? But we can try. We can start. Right? So we can, for example, practice appreciation. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, think of all that we do have. Right? including all our senses, we can see, we can hear, we can, we can think. How fantastic that is. What would it be to be blind and deaf and, and so forth, you know? We don't appreciate what we have. And then our family, those who love us, the beauties of nature, right? Think about how rich and comfortable we are right now compared with former ages. You know, all the amenities we have, all the fence, the nice, you know, plumbing that we have nowadays, the comfortable chairs we have, the nice beds we have, the kind of clothes we wear. Compared with previous ages, you know, we're so rich. Even if in modern society we seem very modest, right? So be content. Practice being content and appreciating what we already have, right? Then practice shamatha by being aware of the breath and then um, gradually as we develop awareness, being aware of the thoughts. So when thoughts of greed and desire arise, we can see them. 
and then we, we can let them go. Try making the, the sort of what we see and, and, and hear and taste and touch, it, it doesn't become sticky, right? Our senses tend to stick to things. And, and then either we like them or we don't like them. And if we like them, then we want them. So instead of that, whatever we see, practicing this open awareness so that things just slide by. We're not attaching. It's like our mind has all these little hooks, right? And it catches on things. So withdraw the hooks back to the Teflon mind, this non-stick mind, right? Allowing things just to arise. We see it. We recognize it gives us pleasure or non-pleasure, and we let it go. We don't catch on to it. It's the catching on to bit which is the problem, right? So, you know, don't cling. Just be aware. Relax, right? This is general agitation and restlessness of the mind. We need to practice being mindful and aware. And it's practice. Back to practice, 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 practice. Throughout the day, as much as we can remember, we try to bring ourselves back into the present moment, into the mind and the body, and just see what's going on there. Everything that we see and hear and taste and touch has this response of like-dislike. But if we recognize that, we can just drop it. We don't get caught up in it. And that's the way to gradually work at reducing our, our grasping mind. When we see the grasping mind, we can release it. And practice shamatha to calm down, you know, and be present in the moment. I mean, it's all connected. It's all dealing with awareness. So we can move on to the next one from uh, coming from Barbara, which says, I took the five upasika vows by myself in front of my little altar, and I have never broken them over the years. I took other vows on my own in the same way. Um, so she asks, are vows taken online valid? Are vows taken on my own in the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas valid? So I would say, honestly and truthfully, such vows taken sincerely in front of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are certainly valid. We do not need an actual preceptor present, although, of course, that's best. You know, I mean, that's best to take it in front of a person. But if that the, you can't do that, then you can just visualize all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and take it in front of the shrine, and and then that's fine. You know, it's it's the mind's um, acceptance of the precepts, which is what is important. And all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are rejoicing, so don't worry about that. They're all saying, "Yeah, yeah, well done, well done, daughter of good family." So. Therefore, vows taken online are also valid. His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other lamas nowadays are even giving empowerments online. Right? Goodness, and that the important thing is our mind's commitment. Right? So, you know, sometimes people take vows in large audiences with the teacher, the lama, or whoever in front, and they're just muttering meaningless syllables. And, and they really don't have uh, understand anything and they don't really know what they're even promising, you know. So is that valid? You know? So maybe it's better to be clear about what we're committing to and, you know, take it also, you know, in front of our, our shrine and imagining the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas present and, and really thinking about what we're doing and what we're saying to my mind, that's more valid. That will plant deep seeds in our mindset and our mind stream for future lives that then we will also again meet very quickly with the Buddha Dharma and have faith in the Buddha Dharma. So the important thing is to plant these seeds in our mind stream, make the commitment and then keep the commitment. And that's what you've done. So from my point of view, I think that's totally valid. 
But that's so only my view. You might ask somebody question. else and they would disagree. I can't say. I'm just saying this is my view. You know, you might ask yes. some Kempo or Lama and they say, no, 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 you must have a Lama there. Right? You know, I can't say. But to my mind, the important thing is our, our mental focus on what we're saying and what we're doing, and that's what really counts. Uh, let me jump to question number 18 that I think will be the last one we can do today. Um, and it comes from Lou Saponi, and it says, what do you want us to remember that will carry us forward from your teachings? Well, I mean, I think the most important thing we can remember is to cultivate loving awareness and to be kind. And to recognize that our life, our daily life, is our opportunity for practice. Yes, we should have uh, a time of formal practice when we sit and we do whichever practice we're doing. We take refuge, we arouse bodhicitta, and we do our, our formal practice. That sets the, the pace for the day. But the most important thing is that we cultivate the ability to, um, to be conscious, to be present, to be aware, and to be kind. And this uh, is our opportunity for cultivating all the paramita. Many of these paramita, like ethics, patience, and uh, so forth, generosity, we need other people. Other people are not the hindrance to our practice. Other people are our practice. And so, you know, therefore, we need to transform our whole day into a beautiful, beautiful merging of Dharma and daily life. And our daily life becomes our Dharma. That's very, 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 very important. We really need to wake up to become more conscious, more aware, and uh, open our heart with genuine caring, kindness, remembering all beings want happiness, and nobody wants to suffer. So at least we can do is not to create more suffering for them, and as much as possible to make them feel just that little bit better at least by being kind and considerate and giving them a nice smile. And not to take ourselves too seriously. I think that's also important. We should smile at ourselves too. Could you speak a little bit more to that, Tsumana? How you think that uh, humor is the seventh paramita? Well, I, I think that the problem for many Dharma practice, spiritual practitioners in general, is that they take themselves too seriously and it all becomes very tight. And, and also, they, you know, it, sometimes people make the Dharma into an extra burden on top of everything else. So then, I, I, I mean, my feeling is the Dharma should lighten us up, not make everything more heavy and more serious. Um, sometimes I say the Dharma it should be like yeast in, in the dough of life. You know, you have this heavy dough that you know, it just sits there, pretty indigestible. And we, we mix a little yeast, not that much yeast, right? Simple, just a little simple piece of yeast into the dough. We don't throw the dough away. We use the dough with the yeast, and then the yeast lightens everything up. The, the dough rises, then we can put it in the oven and cook it, and it's delicious and nourishing. So the Dharma should be making our lives lighter and more digestible and nourishing. And if it's not, if it's making us more tight, more tense, more stressed, am I doing this right? You know, oh God, I got so angry just now. Oh, I'm hopeless, I'm such a useless human being. Obviously I'm going down straight to hell. Then what's the use? What's the use? The Buddha said this is the path of joy. He said, even if this were not a path of joy, if it was a path of suffering, it would still be worthwhile for the results. But it is not a path of suffering, the Buddha said. It's a path of joy. So how much more should you wish to follow the path? Right? 
So we have to look and see if it is light loosens up. Then if we feel lighter, more relaxed, more spacious, more conscious, more kind, people are saying, actually, you're much nicer now, Deb. What are you doing? Then you can think, maybe I'm on the right path. Maybe the bum's working. Thank you so much, Jitsumala, for answering all these wonderful questions. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Jitsumala, for this wonderful session. And um, please continue to participate. And Jitsumala, any final remarks for us to go? You know, I think we should be deeply, deeply grateful for the gift of the Dharma. And as the Buddha said, of all the gifts in the world, the gift of Dharma is the greatest gift. And so we must be deeply grateful to the Buddha and to all the subsequent masters who have passed this wonderful, wonderful teaching down through the millennia to the present day. I apologize for my shortcomings in expounding the Dharma. It is based on my very, very, very small amount of understanding, but I've been in this a long time. That's all I can say. And I know the Dharma works and I can't think of anything more beautiful in the world than the gift of the Dharma. But we have to integrate it into our mind stream. We have to become the Dharma. When we can do that, then we will see that indeed everything which the Buddha promised us can be fulfilled. Each one of us, because why? Because we have Buddha nature. We already have it. It's not like we have to get it from somewhere or we have to develop it. We already have it. Our only problem is we don't recognize it. So all we need to do is develop our inner awareness and recognize our true beautiful nature, which is filled with compassion and wisdom, if only we could see it. It's the sky behind the clouds. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Itzumala. Thank you to everyone present and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you all.